In late June of 1864, the schooner Alvin Clark set sail from Chicago for Oconto, Wisconsin. But the Clark would never reach her port. A severe summer squall capsized the Clark on the Bay of Green Bay, where she would remain for the next 105 years. A dive 110 feet below the surface is considered relatively easy in the warm, gentle waters of the Caribbean. But at the same depth, in the middle of Green Bay, it is an entirely different experience. As the diver descends, the green-colored waters turn to darkness. The surface warmth fades and becomes bone-chilling. Powerful lights which shine strongly on the surface become a faint orange glow, while the exhaust bubbles from the scuba tanks give off a strange hollow sound. When diving first began, the identity of the Alvin Clark was unknown, and for the next year she would be referred to only as the Mystery Ship. In November of 1967, Frank Hoffman began what he describes as a journey which has taken him through time, space, and the hidden corners of his own mind. At that time, Hoffman was the owner of a small tavern in Ake Harbor, a resort and fishing community on Wisconsin's Door County Peninsula. He made many friends among weathered lake sailors and fishermen who patronized his tavern. His promise to do anything he could to help a friend was known throughout the area. Dick Garbowski, a commercial fisherman out of Menominee, Michigan, called on Hoffman to see if he would live up to his promise. That contact would eventually change Hoffman's life. Dick Garbowski, one of the local fishermen from uh, Menominee, Michigan, uh, he entangled his nets on a object underwater. Uh, and of course, then he called me in to uh, see if I couldn't free his nets up for him. From his uh, sonar readings, uh, we knew that there was something down there, something large, possibly a ship. I assembled what gear I could get a hold of. At that time, we were just using uh, old pressure cookers with uh, CO beam headlights and a car battery for light. We took off on the Delhi W. I couldn't get in contact with any of the other divers in our group. Uh, and that short of a notice to come up and help us out with the net. So I had to make the first dive myself. Going down alone, I wasn't feeling too well, you know, myself, but uh, it was a job that had to be done. When I did get down to the net, then I seen what was down there. It was an old sailing ship. In the process of going down and uh, fooling around with the net on the way down, I had already lost one of my knives. And, Thankful that I had the second knife. The pressure cookers that I had, the light kept going on and off. And of course, visibility was a foot and a half. When the light went out, you didn't see nothing. You had total darkness. And I did the uh, best that I could, uh, freeing the net, cutting the net, and freeing it up all the way along. It would keep entangling on something else. And I'd free it from there, get tangled up some more. And after a certain length of time, I knew that I couldn't accomplish the uh, job myself. And uh, so then I returned back up to the surface. And I was never so happy to get up on top as I was after that dive. Winter came early that year, forcing Hoffman to abandon his attempts to remove the nets. Determined to protect his find from scavengers who might destroy potentially historic treasures, Hoffman would spend that winter obtaining the title and salvage rights to the ship. Arrangements were made to assemble a crew that would continue work in the spring. When the ice began moving out of Green Bay the first week of April, Hoffman and his crew were ready to begin diving. Of course, we went out that uh, first dive, the bunch of us together, and of course we had worked on freeing the nets, which was our commitment to Dick Garbowski. And of course, uh, when we had gone down, no one was allowed to uh, tour the ship itself. We were interested in getting the nets off. 
after we had accomplished the uh, job of getting the nets off, uh, then we took a tour of the ship itself to see what it was. Visibility was down to a foot and a half or two feet. We found the wheel of the ship and there was still canvas on the wheel itself. And this was to protect somebody from putting their arm or leg through it. And uh, if the ship would take a fast turn, by somebody could uh, have a broken arm or a broken leg. As to the interior of the ship, we found out that it was entirely filled with silt. So it's in about a uh, foot or so of the uh, deck. The cabin area uh, was the same thing. And when the diver would go in uh, to the silt to get any articles out from inside the ship, silt would stir up and it would hang in the water. You didn't realize uh, up or down or sideways that uh, it was like swimming through a uh, bottle of India ink. It's rather hard to uh, explain the conditions of uh, what divers had to go through. Working down at uh, that depth, you have a pressure of about 50 pounds per square inch. Your water temperature is about 38 degrees. It stays that way uh, all throughout the year. It never changes. And you have to realize also that you only carry so much life on your back. If you uh, extend your time down there too long, you are in real deep trouble then. Uh, a diver could spend 20 to 25 minutes, depending on where he was working. He uh, went and we got us some small pumps in order to pump the silt out so that we could get into the interior of the ship and learn more about it. Well, with our small pumps, we started removing the uh, silt from the interior of the cabin, but uh, we weren't really making very much progress, and of course, we were overcrowding our boats. So I had heard that uh, Harold de Russia from Marinette Marine had a landing craft that he had constructed for himself. And I had never met the man, and uh, so I had gone over to uh, Marinette, and I had talked to uh, Harold de Russia, and uh, he let us have the use of Cleo's barge, was the name of the landing craft, and this was wonderful for us. Uh, now we had more space, and then we were fortunate enough to get us a larger pump, where we could put the pump on the landing craft, we could carry our compressor with us. We had all the comforts of home. The Russia's loan of Cleo's barge, a 60-foot military landing craft, gave Hoffman and his crew new hope that their dreams might materialize. Their past efforts would now seem almost comical in comparison to what they were able to accomplish with their new equipment. The new pumping equipment and hose made it necessary for the divers to connect a vertical aluminum pipe to the ship's mast. Several days were required to rig the stationary gear and determine the best method for attaching the hose. When the hookups were completed, the crew would be able to disconnect the pump hose just below the surface, making it possible for the crew to return to shore for supplies, fuel, or to wait out severe weather. A screening system was rigged to the hose which would filter the silt at the intake section and again at the surface. This would enable the recovery of the artifacts which might be picked up by the pump. The new pump could remove about ten times as much silt as the previous smaller one. But this new system would create other complications. The powerful suction from the pump stirred the silt, cutting visibility to almost nothing. Although the new pump was able to remove more silt, it did limit the crew. And of course we had to change a lot of our safety uh, procedures in the idea of working down there in total darkness in the silt. It was foolish to have two men down there at the same time because you couldn't see each other. One would only get in the way of the other. So we used to keep our safety man up on the ramp of Cleo, and the idea is that the diver working uh, down below, he was, uh, we timed him, and if he wasn't up in his allotted time, that our diver could get down to him. Uh, in order to do this, you never left the uh, suction hose. And this went down into the interior of the ship, and you couldn't see anything. It was your lifeline back up out of the uh, inside of the ship. And, of course, you stayed in the owned area that you were working in so that we could find you. And it was all by feel. 
and of course our crew they got so used to it and everything else like that going up and down uh, they were just tremendous diving continued to recover the artifacts from the silt that had settled over 105 years accumulating in some spots to more than eight feet the divers would straddle the hose and dig at the wall of silt but this became quite risky Hoffman recalls that there were many anxious moments a diver might unknowingly tunnel into the silt and suddenly find himself surrounded by a solid wall this happened to several divers forcing them to back out slowly hoping that everything would not collapse around them for this reason Hoffman insisted that there be no intentional tunneling a cave-in made it easy to remove a lot of silt in a short time, but it was too dangerous. The crew had nearly cleared the captain's cabin after only a few days of pumping. They had recovered dishes, bottles, and other artifacts from the screening system. Everything seemed to be progressing smoothly. It was only after removing nearly 60 tons of silt from the wreck to recover the artifacts that Hoffman and his crew decided that it might be possible to raise the ship. But the warm September days were slipping away, and it became obvious that they would not get the wreck up before winter. As news of the mystery ship spread, Hoffman became a publicity director, public relations coordinator, and would-be fundraiser in addition to his regular duties as captain and diving supervisor. He would spend the days on Cleo diving at the wreck site, later returning to shore to change clothes and work until 3 or 4 a.m. bringing newsmen up to date or seeking funds with which to continue the project. Then he'd return to Cleo and be ready to begin diving again at daylight. Artifacts came to the surface with daily regularity, preserved beyond the crew's wildest hopes by the same silt which covered everything and made their work so difficult. Each new discovery brought them closer to the identity of the mystery ship. Then, a major development took place when one of the crew members came across an account in the Green Bay Advocate of June 1864. The article led them to believe that the mystery ship might be the Alvin Clark, lost that year in Green Bay near Chambers Island. The report said the Clark had capsized under full sail when struck by a severe storm. The captain, first mate, and a man working for passage were lost at sea. Two remaining crewmen were rescued by a passing ship. Research to verify the identity of the mystery ship as the Alvin Clark would continue, but the main concern of Hoffman and his crew would focus on the raising of the ship. In the uh, process of removing the uh, silt and everything was going along fairly well, a uh, decision had to be made as to how we were going to raise the ship itself. and. Uh, we had numerous uh, suggestions from outside sources, and uh, they went from, oh, one thing to another. Uh, they wanted us to use lift bags and uh, raise the ship that way, but we decided that uh, using a lift bag, once the suction was broke off of the bottom, there would be no controlling the uh, lift itself. Before any attempt could be made to raise the ship, the crew would have to remove any excess weight to make it as light as possible. The idea of using airbags or lift drums was considered too dangerous because there was no way to control the speed of ascent and they were concerned that the ship might break apart if she came to the surface too fast. Or a diver might get trapped within the ship and be killed by the rapid pressure change. Hoffman and several of the divers had seen lift drums pull loose on other salvage attempts and the speed with which they broke the surface was frightening. A 55-gallon drum could knock the bottom out of an ocean liner if it came sailing up from 110 feet. The crew collectively decided on a lift cable system which would enable them to raise the ship off the bottom to a point directly beneath a barge. Then it could be transported to a marina where the final raising could take place. It would take several months before the ship would be ready to raise 
but everything had to be perfected well in advance. In the meantime, uh, the time involved and the divers coming up, we were going to uh, be getting later on into the season, and the fellows had to start taking off from work. In order to do this, they had to be compensated uh, for their time off from work, so I uh, took a second mortgage on my uh, motel and tavern for $10,000. And of course, uh, we went through this rather quickly when you have as uh, many people working as we had. By now, Hoffman had completely exhausted his own personal funds, but with the help of Marinette Marine, the raising of the ship would continue. Eurussia located the barge and cables that would be used in lifting the ship the following summer and loaned Hoffman $5,000, which he distributed among the crew members. Hoffman was going deeper into debt with no idea of how or when he would be able to repay it, but he was determined to see the project completed. Winter again forced Hoffman and his crew to discontinue diving. He spent that winter trying to find a home for the mystery ship and attempting to raise funds to enable him to continue the diving next spring. Harold and Jim DeRussia agreed to help with lift expenses and salaries for the divers. So Hoffman began lining up the necessary equipment in order to start diving again as soon as spring arrived. Now that uh, we had the uh, lift cables, of course we had to get the uh, holes cut underneath the ship Oh, we went to uh, Marinette Marine once again, and we uh, had the uh, shipyard vend us some pipe that would uh, have the right curvature of the ship itself so that we could fasten our power head. And, of course, we designed about four different power heads before we finally got one that would do the job that a diver could control underneath the water. And, of course, uh, after numerous tries, uh, we had the uh, right curvature to the pipe and the power head and we began uh, jetting entirely underneath the uh, ship itself. We would jet underneath the ship and fasten a uh, three-quarter inch rope to the power head, pull it back underneath the uh, ship and uh, move on to the next hole, fastening the rope up to the rail. When all of the holes were uh, jetted through underneath the ship and we put uh, six holes through, uh, then we started lowering our steel lift cable and uh, using the three-quarter inch rope, we pulled the uh, steel cable through underneath the uh, ship uh, to the uh, rail on each side. The divers made a final check to make sure that all the cables were in place. A pulley system was rigged to four hand crank winches on the deck of the lift barge. When everything was ready for the lift to begin, 12 men began the slow process of raising the ship. As the slack was taken out of the lift cables, the barge sank about eight inches in the water. For every 100 turns of the winches, the wreck would raise about five inches, and the goal of 100 turns for each man was set by the crew. Sightseers who came to watch the raising of the ship were welcome to come aboard the lift barge only if they would take a turn at the winches. When the barge began to float slightly higher in the water, Divers went down for a quick check and discovered that the ship was finally free of the bottom. They surfaced and announced that the lift could continue. Once we had the uh, ship uh, broke loose of the bottom and the uh, suction, then it was just a, uh, uh, a very hard, tremendous job to crank it to the uh, surface. And of course, the first day uh, when we went out, uh, we had to lay the corner anchors for the lift barge and get all of our cables fastened. Uh, we continued on into the night and uh, we eventually had the uh, cables all hooked up at four o'clock in the morning. And of course we took a break for about an hour and a half until the sun came up and then we started in with the uh, uh, cranking. And of course that continued on through that day and we moved closer into uh, shore. The uh, higher we got the uh, ship up centerboard was uh, down and of course we had the uh, job of getting the centerboard back up into the uh, centerboard box so that we could make the trip up the river to Marinette Marine where the final lift would take place. 
And, of course, it made everyone happy when the bowsprit was up and out of the water and underneath the lift barge itself. We made the journey up the uh, Menominee River and docked it over at Marinette Marine. On Tuesday, Marinette Marine closed the uh, shipyard and let all the workers off. And there were over 15,000 people that had come down to watch the Elvin Clark race to the surface. And uh, it was a tremendous feeling. We had uh, dove on the ship for uh, two years. We had never seen the ship itself in its entirety. All we could see was three and four feet. We were amazed just as much as everybody else was. The work at the shipyard had taken nearly four days. Hoffman worked with Marinette Marine to design and manufacture a sling to lift the ship. Stronger cables were needed to free it from the suction of the water. Large cranes had to be moved to the lift site from other sections of the shipyard, and more powerful pumps were found to remove the remainder of silt from the interior of the ship. All aspects of the final lift were checked and rechecked. If the lifting process didn't go perfectly, the ship could be broken in two while being pulled out of the water. And they wanted no mistakes now that the job was nearly finished. When the lift preparations were finally completed, a crowd of thousands watched as the crane slowly began lifting the ship. Hoffman and his crew looked on with amazement as it at last broke the surface. They could now get a good view of the ship they had worked so long and hard to raise. Until now, no one had seen more than several feet of her at a time. The ship was a 113-foot, 220-ton brigantine. After 105 years on the bottom of Green Bay, the mystery ship had finally reached port. But little time could be afforded for congratulations. There was still a lot of work to be done. The pumps were lowered onto the decks and Hoffman and his crew started to pump out the remaining silt and recover the rest of the artifacts from the cabin area. With the help of Jim Quinn, director of the Neville Public Museum in Green Bay, each piece was carefully cleaned, examined, and cataloged. Quinn had been working with Hoffman on the preservation of the artifacts from the very beginning, and his knowledge would prove invaluable in piecing together the history of the ship. While there were no registration marks on the ship itself, monograms and other identifying marks on the artifacts proved that the mystery ship was indeed the Alvin Clark. The deck of the ship was strewn with blocks and pulleys that had fallen after the rigging had rotted away. The crew was surprised to find many pieces of machinery still in working order. The original bilge pumps were used to help pump the water from the cargo hold. Once again, Hoffman found that the conditions which made recovery so difficult would later become a blessing. The lack of oxygen at the 100-foot depth slowed the deterioration of the wreck. When the ship was at last pumped out, it floated on its own. Hoffman decided to take the Alvin Clark up the river to the marina for the annual blessing of the fleet, so the masts were reset for the voyage. The work was over for Hoffman's crew of amateur divers. They had made nearly 3,000 dives under adverse conditions without an accident and completed a task which professional salvage men regarded as too risky. The mystery ship divers were heralded everywhere as the best there were. And now they were headed back to homes, families, and everyday jobs. But for Frank Hoffman, there was still work to be done the long job of restoration still lay ahead.
After the successful raising of the Alvin Clark, telegrams and letters came pouring in. Howard Chappelle, senior historian of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., wrote, This is a true treasure of the Great Lakes. Your recovery of the schooner is of far greater importance than a few gold coins and a hull fragment from some supposed treasure ship. In your find, we will now be able to put together in great part the real workaday craft of the past. What started out for Hoffman and his crew of divers as an exciting challenge has become a major historical discovery. After 105 years on the bottom of Green Bay, the oldest wooden cargo vessel in the United States has begun opening new doors through which we can look into the past. There were many reasons why the job could not be done. There was no equipment, no experience, no money, and no professional help. But Frank Hoffman and the many people who took part did what they set out to do with faith, perseverance, and a lot of luck. The saga of the mystery ship has not ended. Frank Hoffman is still searching for a permanent home and necessary funds to maintain the Alvin Clark. Preserved in the deep water of Lake Michigan for over 100 years, the ship is now starting to deteriorate. America may soon lose one of her truly historic treasures. People have asked us why we uh, took on the uh, job of uh, raising the ship. And uh, actually it was a challenge to uh, all of the uh, divers uh, that were working with us. We had a tremendous bunch of fellas. Uh, it couldn't have been down, done without them. So we look at here, we look at something that's been underwater for 105 years. It's 131 years old. It's a piece of our history. And uh, like I say, we brought it to the surface. It refloated the uh, day she came back up. And now the whole thing is to uh, take care of the ship, preserve it so that it will last for another 100 years.